Hi, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Packers Unscripted from Packers.com. I am Mike Spofford. He is the one and only Wes Hodkowitz. We're coming to you here from our studios at Lambeau Field. Wes, there are five training camp practices in the books, one of them in pads, in shoulder pads on Monday at the time that uh, that we are taping this episode. So I'm just going to go through here the three different phases of things and ask for your early impressions. I'll, uh, I'll respond and share some of my own. Offensive side of the ball, your early impressions through these first handful of practices. Well, I thought Aaron Rodgers said it perfectly from the beginning. He's like, there's going to be good days. There's going to be days where the defense wins. And certainly the first day in pads, by and large, it was a defensive winning kind of day. But what impressed me was how the offense came back in the two-minute period. And you saw guys, you know, Josiah DeGuara making a key catch down the seam that set up the, the field goal that won the drill or whatever you want to call it. Right. Uh, and also Sammy Watkins came in and, and also had to move the ball kind of, you know, play to get him in territory for that. This offense, I, I know a lot is going to be on Aaron Rodgers' shoulders this year, but there's so many guys that he can rely on and count on. I think you're seeing it the way they're using these running backs right now. Certainly they have to figure out what their starting five is going to look like here. you got to see what happens with David Bakhtiari. But ultimately, I've said it time and time again, For but as much as people were stressing about Devontae Adams, and there's a big reason for that. Matt LaFleur mentioned you know, 80% of the playbook or whatever it was ran through him last season. There are guys ready, willing, and able to pick up that slack, and, and that's what I saw in some of those adverse type of situations. Yeah, I agree with you. That first practice in pads, the defense was definitely getting the better of things, um, but then you saw towards the tail end of the practice, you saw Rodgers in that first-team offense kind of snap out of the sloppiness a little bit. They kind of got things going. They, had, they did put together a solid two-minute drive there. The biggest things that jump out at me in general with regard to the offense in these first five practices, A, that rookie receiver Romeo Dobbs has carried over what looked like a very strong spring in the practices we got to see. Now, we didn't get to see all of them in the spring, but it looked like he got off to a good start in the spring, and he's carried that over, I think, into a good start to training camp. But the other thing, and you just hinted at it in your last comment, is how much these running backs, Aaron Jones and A.J. Dillon, are going to be involved in the passing game for Aaron Rodgers. You can see it in the play designs. You can see it in you know, the way Rodgers looks to them in certain situations and not just, this isn't just the check down stuff when he needs to get rid of the ball. This is, this is design stuff that Aaron Jones and AJ Dillon, wherever they might line up, usually if they're both on the field together, Dillon's the one in the backfield and Jones is lined up somewhere as more of like a slot or a wide receiver, but wherever they're lined up, they're a threat to catch the ball in the passing game in a in a designed purposeful type of way that's what that's what i've seen as much as it's been good to see what al lazard's doing what romeo dobbs is doing and and now sammy watkins getting involved in 11 on 11 now a few days into camp what we're seeing from these running backs i think is the biggest sign of what we're going to see come september and october and when you talked about that transition point in that practice of, of where things started to turn around for the offense i personally felt like it was that sl- the seam route yes that A.J. Dillon ended up running because it wasn't just that Rodgers made a nice throw to him. It's how Dillon adjusted his body to the ball. He looked like a receiver on that play. And for a kid that so many people were questioning, you know, how he catches the ball, he didn't do it often at Boston College. I think over the last 16 months, you've seen him make big strides in that area. And, And realistically, you know, one of the conversations this week with Dillon and Aaron Jones at their lockers was the idea of, you know, 30, you know, 3,000 yards between the two of them this year, you know, kind of metrics that they're putting out there that are achievable, not just about what they're going to do in running the ball, but how they can affect the passing game. And I feel like the, the more you can keep Aaron Jones healthy, the more opportunities that you give Dylan in this passing game, I, I feel like that is going to be the really the recipe here for Green Bay early on as you wait for some of those young receivers to really develop. Yeah, I think I think one of the biggest adjustments schematically that I think Matt LaFleur and Adam Stenovich in this offense are going to make is in order you had your automatic stressor for a defense when Devontae Adams is on the field right we saw how the Baltimore Ravens would lie you know line up three guys in a triangle on one side of the field to make sure Devontae Adams didn't really have anywhere to go he was the automatic stressor I think the stressor that they're going to try to employ 
in 2022 is make the defense react to both of these running backs being on the field at the same time. How do you want to match up with an extra DB, with an extra linebacker? And, you know, and then you have a guy like Aaron Rodgers at the controls who can look at how the defense is matching up and go, okay, this is what we want to do to get ourselves in the best possible play. I think those two running backs are the guys that the Packers are going to use to try to dictate to the defense or at least test the defense, see how they react, and then you let Aaron Rodgers do his thing. Because the more eyes that are ultimately going to be on those backs, the more opportunities it's also going to open up for the passing game. And the Packers have all these guys that play different positions and play all those positions differently in and of themselves that I think really that's going to be a massive opportunity for them. Again, going back to that DeGuara play, DeGuara in that F tight end role, that H back type role, that was a hallmark of what Kyle Shanahan did. You look at what's happening now in Miami with them signing Alec Ingold. And, and I see DeGuar as being a guy that can fit into that as well, along with Dominic Daphne, depending on how all that shuffles out. There are so many different mechanisms and scheme variations that the Packers can work into this thing. It, it's just not your traditional 11 personnel over and over again. The Packers are going to hit you with different waves, and that's ultimately what you have to do when you lose a guy like Devontae Adams. Yeah, well, shifting gears to the defensive side of the ball, I don't think we can start a conversation about early impressions on defense without mentioning the name Rashawn Gary. We, we're there at practice every day. We see all of the 11-on-11 reps, and the guy's just a, a presence on the field play after play after play. Now I think we're going to see potentially even more of that now that the pads are going on. We're going to see him in, you know, the one-on-one pass rush, pass uh, protection drill. But um, Rashawn Gary, the guy just shows up to play every day, whether it's a game, whether it's a practice, even in the jog through, he's going to find a way to make his presence felt on the field. And, and you can just, you can just see now, you know, year number four for Rashawn Gary, he's growing into that really growing into that stand-up outside linebacker, that classic edge rusher, set-the-edge player, but also becoming a, you know, I know it's a cliche, but becoming a true leader by example on the defensive side in terms of how he carries himself. It's the blueprint. It is the way in which you not only look for a first-round pick to, to work and to, to really harness his technique, it's the way you want to see from any player to have that much, you know, kind of fire in the belly, so to speak. And until he stops playing, until he's no longer in Green Bay, the, the thing I'm always going to go back to with Rashawn Gary is the first thing that Mike Smith was saying during his rookie year. When a guy is that physically gifted and he works that hard, those individuals do not fail. Yeah. Because everything, every box is checked in that way. It's just allowing your body to catch up. People forget. I mean, Rashawn Gary is not going to be, what, 24 years old until December? I mean, this and he was coming. a guy who came into the league making a position transition. Yes. He went. He was a down lineman at Michigan, not a nose tackle. Not saying he was an interior guy, but he was a, a down lineman, passer. hand in the dirt, yeah. uh, down lineman at Michigan, and and the Packers drafted him 12th overall with the immediate plan to convert him into a stand up outside linebacker slash pass rusher, and uh, and the 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 transformation. Yes, it did take some time. And he is there now, but yet at the same time, you can see the transformation isn't totally complete because he hasn't, he hasn't reached his peak yet, yeah. I, I don't think. It's just watching him. We had our first opportunity to see the one-on-one pass for us drills. And I wrote it in our Insider Inbox column. I mean, the guy is just shot out of a cannon. And I understand it's a drill that is designed for the defense. Yeah. They, they, they're the ones jumping it. It's a one-on-one situation. They're pinning their ears back. They don't have to worry about the run. But it's when the whistle blows and the ball is snapped, the amount of kinetic energy <laughs> that this young man develops yeah. in an instant yeah. is special. I've never seen anything quite like it. I, I wasn't here for Clay Matthews in like his absolute zenith in 09 and 10 in, in those years. Maybe that's how it looked. Yeah, he was, but, he was pretty darn impressive right from the get-go. But the speed to power of this kid is just off the charts. And again, as long as he can stay healthy and as long as the Packers can find a way to get some snaps off of him throughout the course of the season, I mean, the sky's the absolute limit. Yeah, well, also worth mentioning a couple other things on the defensive side. One, with regard to the two-minute drills that we've seen the last few days in practice, very, very competitive. It's always my favorite 11-on-11 11 11 yeah. to watch is the two-minute because, you know, they'll pit ones against ones, and, you know, there's 70, 75 yards to defend. The clock is running. There's timeouts, whatever. Here we go. 
the defense has had really, really good opportunities to win those. Uh, Shamar John Charles and Adrian Amos in the last couple of two-minute drills both had great chances for interceptions to beat Aaron Rodgers to win to win that uh, that two-minute drill against the number one offense, but came up just a little short. John Charles was ruled to have bobbled the ball and, and was out of bounds out the back of the end zone. And then on the next play, Aaron Rodgers hits Alan Lazard for the touchdown. Correct. Then yesterday, Adrian Amos has a great chance for an interception at the goal line. Can't quite bring it in. Still a solid pass breakup, but because the offense only needed a field goal, they send out the kicker and they win the drill, whereas the defense is kicking itself because, uh, because the unit knows that it should have had an interception there. That's been fun to watch. The other thing, though, I want to touch on is a story that you've got on our website now with regard to the defensive line. And we talked about this leading up to training camp and the changes personnel-wise that were made in the offseason. But the, t- those, the two biggest personnel additions to that defensive line, Jaron Reed and Devontae Wyatt, both starting to show up in practice now. They really are. And th- this is the part of it that I-, I wrote this in the story. I mean, every year around this time, you'll hear Jerry Montgomery talk about it. You heard Mike Pettin talk about it. And, and obviously, you know, the transition to-, to Joe Barry as defensive coordinator, finding ways to, to kind of reduce the workload on Kenny Clark. And-, and by proxy, you know, Dean Lowry. And it's just been so difficult to get those guys off the field. I mean, they basically both played every snap just about in that playoff game against the 49ers. Right. Trying to find ways to deepen that rotation. Well, they did it this offseason. And it came from three different levels. It was the 2021 draft taking TJ Slayton, a a guy that projects as a true nose tackle and had really some explosiveness and twitch. And uh, a guy who was really coming on late in his absolutely. rookie season. Took him a little while to get there, kind of get his feet under him. But we saw Slayton making more of an impact later in the year than in the early part of his rookie season. For sure. Season. And then, you know, you go and get Jaron Reed, a guy that was in that 2016 yeah. NFL draft class with Clark and Lowry, a guy that's had 10 and a half sacks in this league, a guy that's also been a run stuffer and has only missed. I believe it was eight games in six NFL seasons. And then lastly, it was getting Devontae Wyatt for the first time in six years since Kenny Clark, actually investing a first-round pick into that position. And what stood out to me in practice on Monday, it it was twofold. One, just what Jaron Reed could potentially give them in a base front. When When you mix in Clark at a nose tackle position, when you have Lowry at a four or five technique, Jaron Reed is a guy that's going to hold his own on his side of the line. You're not going to have to worry about him. I think we already knew that going in, but actually seeing him in the pads really shows you how he can really eat up some space with his body type. And Devontae Wyatt, again, going back to those one-on-one drills, that does not make a defensive lineman. It does not make you a pro bowler. But I remember watching him on the sled in the offseason program and just seeing the way his feet work, the, the amount of mass that he has there and how quickly he can get from one side to another. Devontae White looked really good in a three technique in the in the one on one spot as well. So the Packers need to find ways to, to lessen the load on, on Clark and Lowry to, to not only just keep them fresh, but make them even more impactful when they're on the field. And for the first time in a few years they might really have the core to do it. Yeah, I, the way I look at the way I look at this unit in this day and age of the vast majority of snaps only three or two down linemen defensively are on the field at any given time that when the Packers have a fivesome of Clark, Lowry, Wyatt, Reed, and Slayton, whatever order you want to put him in, that's, that's as deep a five at that position group as I can recall being around here, probably since, you know, the days of the old four, three before Don Capers even, even walked in the door, so to speak. So, um, that's uh, that's going to be uh, interesting and exciting to watch. I do want to get to some sponsor business here, Wes. Sirius XM NFL Radio delivers hard-hitting analysis and up-to-the-minute NFL news that true football fanatics need 24-7, 365. And at Cousin Subs, we have something for everyone, like our Wisconsin cheese curds, mac and cheese, golden fries, and creamy shakes, all paired with your favorite sub or sub in a bowl. Cousin Subs, we believe in better. All right, I want to hit on a few guys that I that for right now these early stages of camp I consider sort of these intriguing individual stories and I'm going to throw one name your way because you wrote about him the story is still on our website for those who want to go find it and I'm talking about Rico Gafford yeah um 
interesting young man with an interesting backstory here. Uh, tell us what you've learned. He, he's the hopeful, right? 26 years old, was signed as a futures signee back in January. Packers have actually had some good luck with that the last few years, finding guys on their practice squad in the end of the roster um, after the season's over, guys that are just on the street. Gafford is so interesting to me, Mike. Obviously, the 4-2-2 speed going back to his Wyoming Pro Day, that's how this guy got on the map. That's why the Raiders invested three years into him and ultimately tried moving him to the receiver position. The Packers have moved him back to cornerback. That started with a conversation with Matt LaFleur and Rico this offseason. Right after they draft three receivers, you kind of look at the lay of the land. You look at the investment the Packers have made at that position with Sammy Watkins also be added. It, it was going to be up, you know, uphill sledding there for, for Gafford to make the roster. So what about cornerback, the position he originally played to begin with? We're seeing him being used on some of these special teams units. You saw him going back for some, some returns the last few days. But really, it's how he's performed in these number two defensive periods that have impressed me the most. The guy's made quite a few you know, pass deflections, broken up some stuff. He's not been an easy guy to complete against. And when you look at his speed, when you add in the technique and you maybe give a guy with those type of intangibles and you add him with a Jerry Gray – you do kind of wonder what's possible there for this young guy. Now, again, this is his fifth NFL training camp. He's trying to make this thing work. I feel like the hunger is there with Gafford, knowing that he isn't sure how many more of these opportunities he's going to get. And he wants to find his way onto the 53 and through the first week of training camp. I think he's done everything right. Yeah, that guy is, uh, he's lightning fast, man. Sure Holy is. cow, he can really, he can Yeah, really you're not going to get a goal ball on him. Yeah. I mean, you might get him with some stuff off the line of scrimmage, but if you're trying to go downfield, he's going to catch up. It's yeah. very Sam Shields-esque. Yeah, and he's wearing Sam Shields' number he really as is, well, yeah. number 37. So go figure. A um, couple guys I want to mention. One we talked about on our last show, and that's Jake Hansen on the offensive line. And I wanted to bring him up again. He's... He's in one of the two main number one line combinations that we talked about on our last show. I talked with him yesterday, and he's the lead item in yesterday's uh, Five Things Learned from Training Camp, for those who want to check that out. He brought up a really interesting point, and it's the kind of thing that even as long as you and I are around this and we talk to guys and we cover you know, the team on a daily basis year after year that we forget about. And what he talked about is how last year he pretty much spent – all of the regular season practices on the scout team. He was he was scout team offense either at center or guard, depending on you know how they were using him that particular day. Well, what did that mean for him? That meant every single day in practice he's going up against Kenny Clark and Dean Lowry. You know, and so when we talk about how Jake Hansen is suddenly now because of you know Elton Jenkins, David Bakhtiari being out and the line being shuffled around. Jake Hansen is one of the guys being looked at, uh, you know, at guard on the offensive line. How does a guy like that just come out of nowhere? Sixth round pick a couple years ago, practice squad had some injury, had a had an injury as a rookie, a hip injury that required surgery. All of this, then last year, you know, barely appears in some games, you know, for some special team snaps. How does he get to this point? It's because he spent every day in practice yeah. last year going up against Clark and Lowry because he was a scout team offensive lineman. He's a better player now than he was, and the coaches are giving him a chance to show that. So I wanted to just uh, try to expound a little bit on what we talked about with Hanson last time in terms of uh, how he's gotten to where he is right now. And the other one I'm going to keep my eye on the rest of training camp is Randy Ramsey, that outside linebacker. This is a guy, he went down in the fifth training camp practice last year, a really nasty ankle injury. It was a couple of torn ankle ligaments as well as a fractured fibula he ended up being out almost to the day uh, a calendar year. And he's now returned to practice. He's back out on the field. And while the Packers know that their one and two edge rushers are Rashawn Gary and Preston Smith, number three on down the depth chart, however far it's going to go, is absolutely wide open. And Randy Ramsey is a guy, now that he's back on the field and with how much this – organization believes in him when you only spend a fifth round pick at edge rusher and you don't sign any free agents in a year that you lose the Darius Smith and you really only have those top two guys as proven it says something what Brian Gutekunst and the personnel department and Matt LaFleur what they think of Randy Ramsey and what he could bring to this unit when he's healthy so he's a guy in my mind to keep an eye on these next several weeks yeah and keep in mind too i mean randy ramsey this isn't his first rodeo this is his fourth year in green bay now 
I mean, he was an undrafted free agent in 2019 that was on the practice squad. And an impact player on special teams two years ago and as well. And he made that, that jump that, the following year. He, he, you know, Ramsey, we talked to him a little bit before the injury, and you could tell his story and where he comes from, just, just how motivated he is to make this thing go. And if you're going to be an undrafted guy or you're going to be a late-round pick like Jonathan Garvin was or even to some, you know, some extent Kingsley Agnabari, these guys – you couldn't ask for a better opportunity yeah. because the Packers are literally saying, we got a guy in Preston Smith and another guy, a budding star in Rashawn Gary. And when they're off the field, we need one of you young guys to relieve them. So that's where I feel like this competition, it almost is somewhat like the receiver competition to some extent where it's like guys need to step up and they're not going to bring in somebody to take their place. They're asking you to give your best side of yourself to contribute to this cause. So Tipa Nalii, you look at a guy like Ladarius Hamilton came yep. in last year. I thought Hamilton had some pretty good one-on-one reps. O- opportunity is knocking big time at that position. These There's preseason no games, it. Mike, yep. are going to be critical because for Ramsey's case, we, we got to see how they integrate him into this thing. Yeah. But the the truck's already moving with special teams, so it's like you know. Where are you going to be able to add potentially to this defense too? So, and that that's where you know I feel like with him being off, there's going to be a little bit of a curve there to get back in this thing. But but certainly the Packers believe in the kid. They wouldn't have been along on this ride as long as they have if they didn't. Yeah, absolutely. Well, with that, we're up against it. So we'll call it a wrap on this edition of Packers Unscripted. Be sure to follow all of our coverage of training camp, all kinds of stuff for you on Packers.com. For Wes, I'm Mike. Thank you for tuning in, everybody. We'll see you next time.